going through an experience like that and nearly losing your life, uh, you really rethink life and how fragile it is. And then also came to realize that aging is malleable, that we can accelerate it and decelerate it, not just in animal models, but we know we can do it in humans too. We have long ter telomeres like I do. I have telomeres of of a nine-year-old, uh, eight and a half-year-old on average, which is crazy, yeah. I, but I do think that the epigenome is one of the more influential, impactful mechanisms of aging, and it's exciting to see um, the potential behind it. What are the 12 causes of aging, and what can we do each day to slow aging down as much as possible? When will full-body age reversal become possible? How is AI helping solve the problem? Well, today I'm talking about all those things with Chris Mirabal, founder and CEO of Novos Labs, and someone who's all about cracking the code on living longer. We get into his journey, the science of slowing down aging, and some straight up practical stuff that you can use to feel better and live longer. If you're into stretching out your lifespan with some real no BS strategies, this episode is for you. Yeah, tell me about yourself, uh, how, how you got into being CEO at Novos and sure, sure. So, um, so I, I founded Novos. So I kind of uh, made myself CEO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that helps. <laughs> yeah, that helps. Um, I uh, had had an interest in longevity since an early age. So when I was a teenager, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and going through an experience like that, and nearly losing your life, uh, you really rethink life and how fragile it is, and. Um, it's a scary experience, you know, laying in a hospital bed and not knowing if you're going to wake up the next day. So uh, I never wanted to be in that position again, if I could do anything to help it. And so um, that that kind of planted the seed. But back then, uh, we're talking 25 years ago, almost, uh, there wasn't longevity wasn't what it is now, right? There wasn't really a field behind it. And we weren't looking at counteracting the biological mechanisms of aging back then. But that seed was planted such, such that about a decade ago when I came across the paper Hallmarks of Aging in the journal Cell, and then I came across Aubrey de Grey's work and then other researchers, I came to realize that aging was, first of all, the number one risk factor for chronic illness, including most forms of cancer and heart disease and Alzheimer's dementia, like all of the things I, I want to avoid and everyone wants to avoid. And then also came to realize that aging is malleable, that we can accelerate it and decelerate it, not just in animal models, but we know we can do it in humans too. I mean, give somebody a pack of cigarettes a day and a handle of whiskey um, and lay on a couch, they're going to age faster than if somebody is you know, eating healthy outdoors, exercising, breathing fresh air and having a healthy friend circle. That then set me on my journey to do whatever I could to try to slow down aging and Everyone in the field at the time was really either academia or advanced biotech, uh, looking to invent new molecules or looking into CRISPR and modifying the uh, genome or epigenetic reprogramming and so on. But nothing was being done that I could do or, or, or utilize, integrate into my life here and now, um, or that of my loved ones and my family, my friends and so on. And so I started to look into what are ways that we can favorably impact the aging process here and now beyond the obvious of like getting good sleep and, you know, eat a healthy diet. And as I dug in, I was already into supplements and quote unquote biohacking and all of that stuff. And um, I started to dig into the research related to both the mechanisms of aging and then natural substances found to impact those mechanisms of aging, either directly or indirectly. One thing led to another. I networked with um, with Lifespan, uh, Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, and Keith and Oliver and others there, as well as a whole bunch of scientists in the field. And together, uh, we came to realize that there is actually an opportunity here for us to be able to create a company that focuses on going direct to consumer. So from the lab to the consumer with the latest scientific research, giving people interventions that are very actionable and will have a real impact on people's health in the long term, of course, for longevity, but also here and now improving health and how optimized we are and how good we feel today as well. Wow. So how old were you when you had the brain tumors? It was, you were a teenager? I was 16. Yeah. I was, I was on a school trip in New York City and suddenly had a seizure and that's how we discovered it. Oh, wow. Are you in biotech or are you, what's your... I'm, I'm not in... I'm, 
I'm not in biotech. Um, I, I actually studied at NYU Stern, finance, economics, and international business. Um, I've always been interested in science. In fact, while at Stern, I was in the process of starting a, um, a company that, that preserve stem cells from deciduous incisors, also known as baby teeth. Uh, there was a discovery at the National Institute of Health by Dr. Song Tao Shi, who I then collaborated with and was working on establishing this company. Um, in fact, um, I believe it was actually towards the end of high school into college that I was working on that, that company. Um, I didn't ultimately launch the company. Um, at the time, the scientists were also showing that they could induce um, uh, stem cells to become multipotent and potentially pluripotent. So in other words, you would, at least at the time, I thought, well, what's the use of having these deciduous and scissor stem cells if we're going to one day be able to take a piece of someone's hair and then turn it into this pluripotent stem cell that could differentiate into any type of cell? Uh, my business is going to be antiquated before we know it. It turns out science took a lot longer to be able to progress like that, and it's a very expensive process and so on. So uh, companies did end up popping up. Uh, that that do that, but um, anyway, back to your question. No, I'm I'm not a scientist, but I've always been very deeply interested in science and researching it on my own, kind of like a citizen scientist. And I always appeal to authority, so I go to the top minds in those fields and consult with them, and I can speak their language and comprehend what they're talking about, and then put my business mind to work with it. So that's where the sort of drive to connect with like lifespan and and come up with. A, a some idea to help people in longevity. And so what, uh, what gave rise to Novos eventually? Like what was the, the key yeah. idea? Well, it, so what, one thing that I, I would say is that it would be easy, the easy path, and, and many are taking this path and will take this path to look at longevity as this burgeoning industry. And then to just like, go on Amazon, find uh, keywords for specific ingredients, and then create a company, market it as a longevity company and say, hey, I'm done. I have a longevity company. Uh, I, I believe in doing things according to scientific principles, um, to have scientific evidence and, and take a page out of the biotech handbook uh, in terms of, of uh, proving efficacy, safety, and so on, as well as making new discoveries and inventions. And that's quite different than the typical approach, especially because we're dealing with natural over-the-counter products and it doesn't have the same IP protection that a traditional biotech would have. So very, very few have ventured into this particular niche that we find ourselves in. But I do firmly believe that this is the best way that we can go about um, the next generation of health where it's not about coping with a problem after it's already turned into a disease, for example, but preventative medicine um, and doing so with as natural of a compound and lifestyle interventions as we possibly can, that's the next generation. One of, to your question, one of the earlier um, realizations that we came to um, as a collective uh, with all of the people I was consulting with was that it is possible for us to create a formulation that can address all of the mechanisms of aging simultaneously, which was not being done at that time. And part of the reason it wasn't being done is that when you look at biotech companies, they need to create something according to the FDA and EFSA regulations, as well as what insurers will pay out for. So in other words, you need to create something that copes with a disease. And so if you're going to impact the mechanisms of aging, you're most likely going to do so um, as a secondary goal or outcome, as opposed to the primary being the actual disease that you, you need to show efficacy for and safety for. And so this is this core product. The, we're talking about the, the powder. Is, is it put into a drink? Yes, this is it. Um, okay. Novos Core. This is our, our first formulation. We're very proud of this formulation. It is 12 ingredients that combined... Uh, have synergistic effects on the 12 mechanisms of aging. It's a powder that you pour into water, for example. We have orange and unflavored. Unflavored has a subtle taste, so we recommend you mix it into a juice or a protein smoothie or a yogurt. Um, 
And we've done a number of scientific studies, both in vitro and in vivo, proving out the efficacy of this formula. Oh, wow. So you said there's 12 uh, there's signs or pathways to, through which people are aging? Yeah. So, so the 12 mechanisms of aging. Um, so some of them, your audience is, is probably quite familiar with others, especially newcomers to the space are probably not familiar with. So I can quickly just like breeze through them. And then if there are any that you want to talk about, we can, but, yeah. uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, cellular senescence, loss of proteostasis. What is, in- what's, what's proteostasis? We'll so, go. So, Sure. sure. So proteostasis, you can kind of um, dissect the word, right? Proteo of proteins and stasis, like the stability of it. Um, So the proteins uh, have to be folded in a certain way so that they can actually um, uh, function properly. If you have misfolded proteins, they're not going to function properly. And they can actually end up getting stuck in places that they shouldn't, like, for example, inside of the cell or just outside of the cell. Imagine a lot of garbage accumulating um, and then the, the cell is no longer uh, functioning as, as well as it should be. And the protein isn't performing its function, its purpose. Proteins are, are, are the workhorses of our bodies, right? Proteins are the signaling molecules that tell our, our cells and our organs, uh, by extension, how to behave, what to do. Um, they um, are catalyzing reactions in the form of enzymes. Um, most prescription drugs are actually just proteins and they impact um, cells and organs um, um, as proteins. So uh, we start to lose this ability to, f- to properly fold and maintain these proteins as we get older. So I, wait, I've got m- mitochondria, uh, health, senescence. Was there something in between that and proteostasis? Nope, nope. That was it. Okay. it was cellular okay. senescence and then loss of proteostasis. Um, then we've got... Um, uh, let's see, altered intracellular communication. So, you know, all of our cells are communicating with each other and um, that becomes less efficient and um, a lot of communication breaks down. And uh, we all know what happens if you've ever been in a relationship when communication breaks down, <laughs> everything goes awry. Uh, same thing within our bodies. Are we talking about like extracellular vesicles when when we're talking about communication? Aren't those sort of the little mRNA messengers? I believe so, um, but we're talking just in general, all of the communication. So, um, you know, for example, a, a cell, um, a, a muscle cell might might release some free radicals because you're exercising. And in that case, it's actually a positive, although we think of free radicals as being bad, in this case, it's actually helpful because it's signaling to the body, hey, we need to go back and repair these muscle cells. Uh, uh, cells that are screaming out for help, essentially, we need to go repair them and through the process of hormesis, make them even stronger than they were before. So um, there are all of these, these, you know, if you look at the metabolome and the proteome specifically for the proteins, um, there are all of these, these molecules throughout our bodies that are, are communicating with one another and essentially telling our bodies in this vast quantum network, essentially, how to, uh, how to function. Yeah, I'm familiar with the Yamanaka factors in David Sinclair's work, and I'm, I'm excited to see how those, I think he's on human trials with the uh, ma- uh, macular degeneration. Yes, yes. It, it'll, it'll be great to see how, how, those, um, how those trials end up. You know, um, we, we, gotta, we have to prove this out in humans. Um, and there, there's still a lot of challenges, and it's one thing to rejuvenate an organ. It's a whole other thing to rejuvenate the whole body system. Um, there, I, th- I do believe that there is more to aging than simply addressing the epigenome. I think that we need to address other mechanisms of aging at the same time. Uh, but I do think that the epigenome is one of the more influential, impactful mechanisms of aging, and it's exciting to see um, the potential behind it. Okay, that's six. That's six. Telomere shortening. This is a popular one because a lot of people at some point thought that telomeres were like essentially the be all end all when it comes to aging. And then like once your telomeres get too short, then that's it. And you can measure someone's telomere length and determine how old they are biologically. But the correlation for telomere length and biological age is not nearly as strong as other things like the epigenome. Uh, But with that said, telomeres are part of the aging process. These are the protective end caps of our chromosomes. Our chromosomes contain our DNA. So think of our our 
uh, telomeres is like the end caps of our shoelaces. And then our DNA is kind of like all of the thread fibers within our shoelace. So if the end of that shoelace comes detached, the telomere is detached, then all of the the threads come out and or the DNA. And so now the DNA is prone to damage and and um, it doesn't function the way that, that it should. And so if we look at telomeres, uh, as long as your telomeres are not too short, you're in a good place. But if they become too short, you reach something known as the telomeric brink. And that's the point at which the incidence of disease goes up significantly, especially for example, gastrointestinal cancers um, and your risk of mortality goes up. So you just, it's kind of more of a check off the box type of metric. You wanna make sure that your telomeres are not too short. You're not getting short too rapidly that you're in a healthy percentile by your chronological age. Um, and then as long as you are, then it's something that you can just kind of keep an eye on, but it doesn't, if you have long ter telomeres, like I do, I have telomeres of, of a nine year old, uh, eight and a half year old on average, which is crazy. Yeah. I, <laughs> nothing else about me is like a nine year old. I promise you. Um, <laughs> um, uh, no, just my, your, my just your childlike sense of joy. I'm sure. Exactly. My, I was going to say my, my maturity, my girlfriend might say at times it's like a nine-year-old. But um, uh, with, with that said, um, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that doesn't mean because of that, that I'm going to live longer, right? It's just that if my if my telomeres were that of a 100-year-old, of a then I would be quite concerned. That's when you should be concerned if okay. they're too short. Um, now, so telomeres, I was thinking, I wrote telomeres down next to geno uh, genomic instability or DNA damage. Um, because I figured that was closely connected, but you're saying that's kind of its own thing. It's its own thing, but they are con closely connected. Okay. The fact is all of these are closely connected. They are all intimately connected with each other. And when one has a negative outcome or an acceleration, then the other ones are going to be impacted. There's a ripple effect. And so this is part of the reason why we wanted to positively impact all of the mechanisms because if you only impact one, you can only go so far if you impact all of them. It's like the analogy that Aubrey de Grey gave in his book when I first got into this space. He talks about aging and, and he likens it to a car, an old car. Um, and you can think about like the tires have deflated and it's rusting and the mufflers falling off and so on. Um, if you only inflate the tires, how far are you going to get in this car? Not very far. But if you refurbish everything in the car, you can take a car that's 70 years old and it can function better than some cars that are 25 or 30 years old, right? Um, not all of them, but it could function better than some of them. Um, yeah. But the point is it'll function far better and it will have a lot more mileage on it than if you only address one single problem with the car. And the same thing goes with the mechanisms. Um, it seems that if we address all of them simultaneously, we can get much further with the impact that we have on on aging and on health. Yeah, I guess you're you're also only as uh, functional as your as your weakest part. So you you got to have a good general health, but also nothing can go catastrophically wrong. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. I mean, if if you have for one reason or another just this this crazy amount of DNA um, uh, mutations. Uh, like, yeah, it's only a matter of time before it catches up to you and it turns cancerous, for example. And do each of these things, and we're on, we've, we've gone over seven, so a few more to go, but do each of them have their own age clock? Can you, can you measure the age of each one of these 12 things or, or do you get your biological age by kind of an average, uh, you know, measurement? Yeah, you, you can't, you cannot get a biological age for each of these things. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of telomere length. So I mentioned my telomere length is that of, of a child, basically. Um, but my epigenetic age is that of someone in his late 20s. I'm, I'm 40 years old now. Um, so um, the, the, I, I mentioned earlier that like telomere length is not that closely correlated with chronological age and by extension with biological age either. So that's why you can't uh, just take a telomere length and say, okay, this person is X years old. It's been found that there's a much closer correlation with the epigenome that um, with biological age and with chronological age, depending on which algorithm you're using, uh, than these, these other uh, mechanisms. 
Uh, with that said, there are other ways to measure biological age as well. You can try hematological um, algorithms that take a, a number of different blood tests, and then there are algorithms that can approximate how old you are biologically from those. Um, accuracy, I would argue, is is lower than the epigenetic tests, but it's it's still available. Uh, there are transcriptomic clocks that are in development, proteomic clocks, metabolomic clocks, even microbiome clocks, and so on. So there's many different ways that we can try to approximate uh, biological age, even on an organ level. But we can't look at each and every one of these different um, mechanisms and compute somebody's age from it. All right. And we'll get into clocks uh, a little bit later when we, we talk about the longevity Olympics. But um, let's, uh, so I think we're, we were, we did telomere shortening. I think we're on number eight, I'm trying to find out what all these, uh, what every one of these oh, okay. uh, mechanisms of aging are. Sure. So, so number eight is deregulated nutrient sensing. So our bodies have these ways to sense nutrients and whether um, we have adequate nutrients or if, if they're abundant and what those nutrients are and so on. So there are some processes that are closely associated with longevity that the audience might have heard of or know about. For example, mTOR, uh, that's a growth pathway. When you have a lot of protein and carbohydrates, the body activates the mTOR pathways and our, our body, that's a, a, a period of abundance. Um, and then you've got, for example, AMP kinase, which is a cellular starvation signal. This is something that's activated by, for example, metformin, which is oftentimes used as a prescription um, drug in the context of longevity. Uh, mTOR, which I, I didn't mention earlier, uh, rapamycin is the drug associated with that um, process. And so our bodies are not as capable of, um, of, of managing these nutrient uh, signals as we age. What is the what is the mechanism for managing the nutrient sensing? I see deregulated nutrient sensing, but I'm like, yeah, but what? There's no like, it's not like there's a telomere or a or a cell or a mitochondria, like a structure that single structure that does that, right? It's like, uh, or is there? Um, no. Uh, well, my understanding is that the uh, the nutrient sensing pathways are. Um, are, for example, signals that can be sent via mitochondria, um, the, uh, which are, are producing the energies uh, or the energy molecules like ATP um, from uh, the, the foods that we're consuming, like the fats and the proteins and being able to um, break those, those down into, um, into ATP. And so um, that is one of the ways that our, our bodies are um, detecting it. Okay. So what's the next one? Uh, number nine? Sure. So number nine is stem cell exhaustion. So our stem cells are the cells that essentially make replicates of themselves, duplicates of ourselves. So, you know, our cells are constantly getting damaged, dying off and so on. And so we need to replace them and our stem cells, stem cells are what do that. Um, now our cells have what's known as the Hayflick limit. That's the fact that they can only divide so many times uh, before they no longer can. Um, every time there's a cellular division, here's another mechanism of aging at play, our telomeres get a little bit shorter. As we age, we have fewer stem cells because naturally some of them die off. And then those that still do exist, uh, they're not as, as effective. They're, they're not making perfect replicates anymore. Um, and they're also reaching their Hayflick limit as well. So that's the exhaustion of stem cells. Uh, next, uh, so the next three are some of the newer mechanisms of aging. So there were originally nine published a decade ago. And then um, about a year and a half ago, those original researchers published a new paper and they added three new mechanisms of aging. So uh, the first one is inflammaging. And this is the idea that as we age, we have chronic inflammation that increases. So at first it starts as this quiet whisper and then it turns into this barely noticeable hum. And then it's eventually this very loud, annoying noise um, across our bodies, right? 
And so this is this chronic inflammation that is age associated and is the result largely of all of these other mechanisms conspiring against us. For example, senescent cells, they release inflammatory molecules known as a SASP. These inflammatory molecules cause inflammation nearby and they also cause nearby cells to get damaged and potentially have DNA damage and or turn senescent themselves. Um, and then if there's DNA damage, of course, you need to replace that cell so the telomere gets shorter. And then you use your stem cell to do that. And your stem cell uses one of its divisions and so on. So you see how all of these pieces kind of come together and have all of these results. Man, it seems so much easier to try to not age than it would be to like reverse it after all this is like going on in your bed once the domino effect starts to happen it seems like uh so so much more complex yeah yeah so yeah and, and we're very careful about that at novos we don't say we reverse aging we talk about slowing down the process right um and um i, I you know there are researchers working on ways to reverse aging uh, but they're if we're if we we look carefully at it, they're largely just focused on individual organs. For example, like let's reverse aging in this one organ, like the eye, make it youthful again. But that's quite different than a reversing the age of our entire bodies. That is something that I believe um, we are, are are far away from being able to do. No, I I agree with that. I haven't seen anything uh, in in any of the research that we've been doing that says that that's right around the corner at all. Um, I guess the thing I'm, the thing that seems the most promising is these Yamanaka factors. Um, but how do you properly, you know, administer that to an entire body is, uh, nobody's really talked about that yet. Right. Right. Yeah, definitely. So next is uh, disabled autophagy. So autophagy is this cellular upkeep recycling process. So I referenced it earlier, but imagine you have a cell that's getting old, it's not performing its function well. So our, uh, largely our immune systems will identify that cell and then uh, basically cannibalize it. It will um, destroy that cell and then recycle its component pieces. And this is important because you don't want a lot of old cells that are not performing well. They might become senescent. They might have DNA damage and mutations and so on. Um, and they're just obviously, sitting there causing inflammation, right? <laughs> and they cause inflammation. Exactly. And yeah. I mean, ultimately our, our organs and by extension, our tissues work because the cells are working and doing their job. And if you have too many cells that are not doing their job, the tissue won't function well. And then the organ won't function well, right? That's yeah. part of disease. So, um, our bodies need to recycle these cells and our bodies are not as good at detecting which cells need to be removed and then actually effectively removing them as we get older. And then finally, the, the, the 12th one um, is quite different from the other ones in the sense that it's a specific um, organ system, so to speak. It's uh, uh, microbiome dysbiosis. So by now we're all familiar with our microbiomes. Um, our microbiome actually extends to our skin and um, it goes from um, our mouth to our butt. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's really our intestines, our colon that, that we're talking about. And as we age, our microbiome, um, it changes. It becomes less diverse. And um, some of the healthy bacteria we have less of and some of the unhealthy bacteria we have more of. Some of that unhealthy bacteria is inflammatory bacteria, which again, brings up the point of inflammaging. And... Uh, so the, uh, what's also important to, to mention is that our, our microbiomes have these gut organ axes. I believe there's seven of them. Um, we have the gut brain axis. Part of our food cravings and our moods are, are altered or impacted by our gut microbiomes and the foods that we eat. Um, we've got a gut kidney axis, a gut liver axis, a gut skin axis, and so on. So the gut is actually impacting many different organ systems, our heart. And, um, and so it's important for us to also pay attention to these trillions of bacterial cells within our microbiome 
and the ways that they can impact our overall health and aging. Yeah. Wow. It seems like the microbiome is, uh, the more I hear about it, it's just so, so important and, and incredible how much it can change your body. I actually got banned on TikTok because I did a video about a study. I wasn't claiming anything, but it was uh, people taking a a poo pill, basically, <laughs> and uh, and curing uh, peanut allergy. And, uh, you know, people are having, people are losing weight and uh, curing, I don't know, diabetes and things like that off of these uh, microbiome transplants and uh it's like uh, performance enhancing poo <laughs> <laughs> yeah right yeah i mean I, I what i would say is that there is a lot of potential uh, behind the microbiome and there's a lot of exciting research being done and some stuff even in, in the clinical setting like you're referring to but i would also say that it is almost Pandora's box. Like we know very little about it right now. And as much as, you know, the probiotics are sold and we talk about it as if we know it very well, it's, we, we know very, very little about the microbiome at this point. It is so incredibly complex and they're so diverse and it's like a fingerprint. Everyone has a different microbiome. And then the second you consume something, you are changing the state of your microbiome. Um, you know, you have a beer, you have a, a pretzel, you have a broccoli, you have a sweet, like any of these things are changing the state of your microbiome. So it, 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 there, it, there's a lot of complexity to it. It's very exciting, but we have a long way to go to fully uh, wrap our hands around it. And so how does the core product try to support um, all, uh, you know, our body's ability to keep all these healthy? Yeah. So, so the product contains 12 ingredients. We talk about this on our website. Uh, we've got a section in the science area called approach. And uh, I'm actually going to pull it up quickly on my screen. So I, I don't forget any here, but uh, we, we followed um, this specific approach so that we could create the best formulation we believe exists in the longevity space. And so the very first thing that um, or filter we put ingredients through because there are many different ingredients we considered, hundreds of ingredients we considered for our formula, many of which are, are being sold by other companies and, and purported to have longevity effects, but um, we actually did not include intentionally. And so the first is, for example, each ingredient needs to impact at least one, but ideally multiple of the mechanisms of aging. So it's just a coincidence that we have 12 ingredients and there are 12 mechanisms. Most of the ingredients are actually impacting more than one of the mechanisms and they're doing so synergistically. Uh, the second is that they need to be able to extend lifespan in various animal models, which this hints at conserved evolutionary pathways. So what I mean by that is imagine if we had um, a substance that extended lifespan in mice, but it didn't do so in C. elegans, these little worms, or Drosophila, these fry, uh, flies, then it would seem to be something that's very specific to the mouse species that we are impacting. And so therefore, it's far less likely it's going to have a positive effect in humans. But if it works in C. elegans and in Drosophila and in mice, and then ideally in other animal species like certain fish, like killifish, or in dogs, or in primates, uh, then you are increasing the likelihood by a significant amount that it also works in humans because evolution determined that whatever you're impacting with that substance is so important that it needs to conserve it in species after species after species. And is it is incredibly unlikely that it would not have conserved it in humans as well. And so it is most likely going to have a favorable effect on our health and lifespan as a result. The next filter we put things through in our approach is that they're associated with a reduced risk of different aging related processes and outcomes in both humans and animals, which indicates that they act on the underlying um, aging process. So maybe they, for example, have favorable effects on brain health or heart health or boost the metabolism. Um, maybe they help with sugar metabolism and so on. Um, all of these, these things are associated with better health, 
and um, and therefore it's fair to reason that they're going to, at the very least, improve human health, um, but also by extension because of the other factors we're discussing, also improve human uh, lifespan. So uh, next is that they're associated with a reduced risk of mortality in humans. So some of the substances in our formula have a lower risk of mortality. For example, uh, gl glucosamine, a very large study of hundreds of thousands of people, found that those who took glucosamine had significantly healthier hearts and blood vessels and um, lower rates of all-cause mortality, especially from cardiovascular disease. So it's not a guarantee that that's the case, and we can't make any sort of medical claims like that, but it is something that we considered in terms of why include the ingredient in the formula. Um, all of the ingredients are nature-based. They're found in food or, importantly, in human biology, but the levels decline as we get older. So we're kind of replacing some of these molecules that might be critical to our health. Um, they have a very low side effect profile or no significant side effects whatsoever. And they've been used by decades or even centuries in some cases, arguably even millennia um, in humans. And they have had no significant side effects um, or negative um, um, afflictions um, as a result from, from it. And then finally, they are um, acceptable according to FDA and EFSA um, so th those are the, the filters we put everything through. And then of course, we're looking at all of the scientific studies and which mechanisms of aging each of the ingredients might be uh, impacting. We go beyond the mechanisms of aging. We also think of other uh, biological um, uh, processes, like for example, hormesis we mentioned earlier. This is where our bodies come back stronger from a stressor. Well, certain ingredients like terastilbene, for example, which is a cousin of resveratrol, a superior cousin to, to resveratrol, um, has a hormetic effect. And so you don't want to overdo the hormetic effects because eventually hormesis can turn to poison, right? Like if you exercise too much, you're going to um, have rhabdo. You're going you're gonna to have excess muscle breakdown, right? Like there's always a limit to it before until the hormesis turns actually into damage. So we were conscientious of other biological processes beyond just the mechanisms of aging when we were deciding which ingredients to include and not to include. And eventually it led to us creating this formulation. Are these things that people are deficient in or do they need to, or do some of the things show up in our food? Like how, and, and, and this is kind of a one, one size fits all uh, sort of characteristic. So is it, is it just something that everybody should take to get, um, you know, have a baseline level or are these, does it, does it relate to like def deficiencies because of our lives and our, you know, the way we live that we've become deficient in these things or it's everybody's always deficient in these things? So the answer to all of your questions is yes, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, 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 I'll go through each of them. So yes. Um, these are molecules that are in human biology, but decline with age. So for example, alpha ketoglutarate, uh, hyaluronic acid levels decline as we get older. And uh, by supplementing, um, we can um, uh, improve health outcomes. Uh, yes, these are ingredients found in food. For example, fisetin is found in strawberries. Terastilbean is found in blueberries. Um, the lysine is found in human biology, but also found in food. For example, uh, collagen protein contains glycine. It's an amino acid. Um, and yes, this is something that we have been consuming for a long time. For example, um, take lithium. So we have trace dose of lithium. It's one milligram. Um, so when you think of prescription doses of lithium, you're talking about hundreds of times more typically, um, and the dose changes the, the, the effect significantly, as we know for practically everything that we consume. So at this very, very low dose, a trace dose of one milligram, it is more or less the quantity that we consume when we're having, for example, um, uh, natural spring water 
Um, the well water, for example, or, or streams contain high levels of lithium. For example, San Pellegrino brand has high levels of lithium in it. And it's because lithium is an element that's in stones and it leaches through the stone into the water. And so we've had it in our, in our water supply. Um, animals have had it in their water supply. And so by extension, when you eat a salmon, that's, you know, wild salmon in the stream, it's going to have some lithium in its body that you're going to consume as well. The issue is that in modern times, all water is municipal water supply. It's filtered. We're buying filtered water. We're filtering it at home. Uh, we're consuming farm raised fish and animals and so on. And so our lithium levels have gone down significantly. But studies have found, for example, people with higher levels of lithium um, in their communities have lower rates of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, dementia, uh, uh, depression, um, suicide, all of these mental conditions, bipolar disorder, all of these mental conditions, lower rates of it, um, significantly lower when people have some lithium in their water supply. Anyway, it has a favorable effect on the epigenome, on brain health, on cognition. Reminds me to uh, change the mineral remineralization filter in my water filter. <laughs> I hope it's got yes. lithium in there. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, if, you, if you've ever come across these trace mineral drops uh, on Amazon that a lot of people purchase, they do, that does have lithium in it, for example. So there are multiple products out there that contain some lithium. Um, it is natural. It has been in our food supply. It's just something that most of us are not getting anymore. Okay. And so has the, I think Keith mentioned something to me about the, the, the nature of the product and how, how you guys do the formulation. Do you, do you change it over time in, as a reaction to any uh, ongoing studies or how, how customers are reacting to it? Is there, is there an evolution in this, in this product or is it Set in stone. It's a great. It's a great question. So uh, when we first planned Novos, the intention was to to uh, take almost a Soylent type of approach of like constantly iterating and having new versions of the formula as we progressed. Ultimately, we decided not to do that. The reason being that we are doing significant scientific research on our formula cons constantly. Uh, and each time we change the formula, we would have to throw out that scientific research and start fresh again. And so, um, what, you know, why fix something if it, if it ain't broke, right? Like, uh, what we're finding from the scientific research has been, um, I would say largely lucky. I mean, we, we did design this very precisely, as I mentioned, we spent a lot of time and care to design this formula. But at the end of the day, biology is finicky, it's difficult. And um, so there is definitely a dose of luck in this that we ended up with such positive scientific results, which we can talk about, but everything from studies of DNA damage to cellular senescence to an inflammatory process known as oxytosis, ferroptosis, um, to epigenetic aging, um, and even um, animal lifespan, we've had very yeah. favorable effects across all of the studies. And so why change it if humans who take our product as well report very positive outcomes? And in the case study we show, we reduce epigenetic age as well. So all of the evidence is pointing to this working. So, you know, don't, don't change it if it's working. So right. What's the biggest, uh, thing that people report or what, or that the studies show, um, the biggest change from, from doing it? So I'll answer that from, from a more subjective um, customer perspective as opposed to like a scientific uh, objective marker. But the, the most commonly reported benefits from our, our formula, I'd say number one is an improvement in mood and cognition, like focus, mood, reduction in, in just like your, your mind bouncing around or, or anxiousness and so on. So um, that's probably the result of the microdose of lithium, L-theanine, which is found in green tea, which can help with focus, magnesium malate, which can also help with calmness and focus and many, many other things as well. Um, and glycine can potentially help with that as well. 
Second is improvements in sleep and by extension energy. So I, I believe that most of the energy effects are probably the result of improved sleep. Though something like rhodiola rosea, which is in our formula, it's an adaptogen. Uh, it has been studied to help people who are kind of like tired to feel a little bit more energy and people who are over energized to be a little bit more calm. So perhaps that's playing a role as well. But I do think that most of it's coming from probably just improving sleep and then improving metabolic function as well and improving energy that results from that. Uh, and then the other very commonly reported effect is improvement in skin health. So that usually takes about four to eight weeks for people to see. Uh, it's not like a, a miracle cure. You're not going to go from having deep inset wrinkles to them disappearing and you looking like a, an Instagram filter. Like that's not going to happen. <laughs> but <Damn> it. Uh, <laughs> but it, in terms of just like improving your complexion, um, looking like your skin looking more well hydrated, the fine lines not really showing as much. That's something that's very commonly reported. I see it myself. My father, uh, he was a beta tester for our product years ago before we launched, like four years ago. And my mother uh, at the time, after like 40 plus years of marriage, never complimented him on his complexion once. Didn't know anything about him testing our product and didn't even know it would do anything for skin. And said on her own, Len, your skin looks, uh, your, your complexion looks good uh, or great. <laughs> so like, you know, it's something that in 40 years she's never said to suddenly say it at that time. Like that, that was something that at least in the early days of the company got us very excited to, to hear something like that. Nice. Okay. And what are the, the scientific studies uh, showing that are, the, that are the biggest changes? Sure. So just on the theme of skin health, a uh, couple of things to report there. We did a preliminary study, so it wasn't a full scale scientific study, but it was a small experiment early on in the company where we measured skin firmness and um, we use a device called an indentometer by a company, Courage and Kazaka, which is an industry standard. And we found that we can increase after six months of use of core, it increased on average uh, skin firmness by me um, measurement on the cheek by uh, 22%, which is quite significant. Wow, that is significant. 22, I would like 22% tighter cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and, um, and so uh, on, on that same theme of skin health, we just published a peer-reviewed study in the journal Nutrients last month which uh, it was done at the University of Bologna by scientists at, at the school. And they uh, looked at a 3D spheroid of a, a keratinocyte, which is a skin, a skin cell. And it looked at DNA damage uh, from uh, chemotherapeutics. So it looked at two different chemotherapeutics, uh, one of which was very intense and causes tons of double strand breaks and single strand breaks of the DNA. It's like mutilation of the DNA. And we had statistically significant uh, protection, protective ef effects on the DNA strands, uh, which the researchers concluded indicates that we are likely having, uh, you know, rejuvenating and, and protective um, effects on skin, um, skin cells and skin health. And so um, that was encouraging to see. Of course, that's an in vitro study. Um, let's see, we, we've done, uh, I, I'll, I'll start with the most exciting thing that, that we've gotten recently is we did a mouse study and uh, that was at Newcastle University in the United Kingdom. And we had a positive control and a negative control. We're going to be publishing the preprint of the study within about two weeks. And the negative control is basically mice not getting anything. And then the positive control is mice getting injected with a combination of two prescription drugs. One is an R&D prescription drug that's not yet available for the public. The other is a, um, a senolytic that is available, but they have been proven to extend mouse lifespan already in previous research. So we're now comparing ourselves in this study to doing nothing and we need to show statistical significance to that um, as well as comparing it to these um, these um, uh, prescription drugs and we found we performed just as well as those prescription drugs 
uh, we extended mouse lifespan by about 20%, wow. which is, as far as I know, it is the greatest percentage increase in healthy life mouse span, uh, healthy mouse lifespan of um, any natural substance over the counter ever studied. So that's something that's very exciting for us because now we're getting closer and closer to humans. It's, it's a mammalian species. And, um, and that's very significant increase in lifespan wow. and, uh, tested them epigenetically before and after with the Dunedin pace clock out of Columbia and Duke universities. And we found that we were able to slow down epigenetic pace of aging, um, by the equivalent of more than one month per year for nearly three quarters of the participants and the one quarter that did not improve, they did not get worse which indicates that we're probably having some sort of protective effect on them. If, um, if you have all of these people, you would expect some of them would have sped up aging. Uh, even if we slow down aging for more of them, some should have sped up. But the fact that they didn't makes us believe that we might be having some sort of protective effect. And so this warrants uh, you know, clinical trials to be able to understand that. Do you think it's possible ever to get actual age reversal by figuring out some perfect supplement or lifestyle regime or or will we you know to to get actual age reversal you know living to 200 or or longer is it going to have to be some other sort of intervention like with the yamanaka factors or genetic engineering or nanotech or something i want to be precise in in um the semantics here so Age reversal, meaning we're actually biologically reversing the age. So if, if I'm 50 and I look 50, I'm now turning 40 and looking 40 again. I don't think we'll ever achieve that through purely natural means. We need to invent technologies to be able to, to get us to that point. Um, and, and so you know, what Novos specializes in, which is on over-the-counter natural products, um, we are, at least in our, our current form as a business, we are not going to be creating reversal of aging. It's something that, like I said before, I think is decades away. Um, maybe on an organ level, we get there sooner, but on a whole body level, it's decades away. Uh, in terms of slowing down aging and enabling people to live much longer, healthier lives, I think we're already there. And then the question just becomes, how much more can we do to extend healthy lifespans that much more. Uh, yeah. Do you think AI is going to help advance that? AI will definitely help advance it. I mean, we're already using AI internally more on the R and D side of things. And, you know, there's many different definitions of AI, by the way. Right. So it's not all the chat GPT LLMs, right. It's, there's much more to, to AI than that. Um, so yes, it will definitely advance things. It will accelerate things, um, significantly. How are you guys using AI? Um, it, it's more on the like big data side of things in, in terms of experiments that we use and algorithms that we build and, um, um, and yeah, an analysis of, uh, I can't say too much in, um, in terms of like our R and D pipeline, but it's, it's largely based on analysis of, of large data sets and helping us to make more informed decisions based to on help you find new, uh, new ingredients. That's, that's one of the use cases. Yes. Okay. Interesting. And no novel combinations as well. I'm currently taking so many things that uh, I'm wondering if maybe I can uh, consolidate. You know, consolidate. Simplify. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I'll be looking into it for sure. When I founded Novos, I founded it as a public benefit corporation. To, oh, I was going to ask about that. Yeah. To try to do more for the public interest than a typical for-profit company would do. Oh, yeah. Can you explain a little bit what, so what's the difference between a public, uh, would you, would it, benefit, would, corporation, benefit corporation, a PBC? And, and a regular company? Sure. So um, I guess the simple way to put it is that a, um, a regular company, it's your fiduciary duty as ex an executive or CEO of the company to do everything you can to maximize profitability and shareholder value. As a public benefit corporation, it slices out a little bit of an exception where you declare in your uh, corporate charter, your filing docs, um, what you want to do for public benefit. 
And, um, and then that gives you a little bit of leeway to make some decisions that are going to be for the public benefit, um, even if it has a, a moderate cost to it or a reasonable cost. So a very simple example I give is that imagine you have a business scenario where you can make $10 but do nothing for public interest. And another scenario where you can make $9 but do something great for humanity. Um, as a as a for-profit business, you might not be able to make that $9 decision. Um, it, it's, it's harder to do um, because you're not, in that case, maximizing shareholder um, um, interest. For a public benefit corporation, I have the fiduciary bil- ability to now um, make that decision. So we add another stakeholder into the equation, which is basically the public. And so there are multiple ways that, that we try to fulfill this. So for example, we've launched a free mobile app called Novos Life. And uh, this includes a free biological age test in it. So for those who don't have the budget to spend three forty nine dollars on our Novos age clock, um, they can get essentially a free version, which is more accurate than the first generation epigenetic blood-based clocks like the Horvath clock. It's just based on a survey. And to your question about AI earlier, it is built off of AI. Uh, we didn't build it ourselves. A professor, her name is Sue In Lee at University of Washington, who is a brilliant mathematician. She won the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in mathematics, the only female, I believe, to have ever won it. She um, created the algorithm and worked with us for us to integrate it into the app. And so after just over 20 questions, you can get your biological age output for free. We also have personalized recommendations for how to slow your aging based on your lifestyle. Um, you answer survey questions and we can guide you. Um, we have um, an LLM built in, so it's trained off of longevity information and your survey responses and very soon wearables like Aura, Whoop, Apple Watch and Android and so on. Um, and we'll be able to give you customized, personalized recommendations and um, observations about your your lifestyle habits um, all within the app. And everything is free. So it's Novos Life on Android and iOS. And that's, again, part of us uh, focusing on being a public benefit corporation. Wow. Why isn't every company a public benefit corporation? And it seems like, you know, when you, you look at, let's say, SpaceX, and it's like their their mission statement is like, we're going to make life multiplanetary. And they seem to be making decisions based on that. But you're saying potentially the shareholders if if it were public or i'm i'm not sure how that works but they might not be able to do that if there was other options for them to make money and not get to mars well it wouldn't be that clear cut because like if if elon as as the leader of spacex is is determined to get to mars and um um has a vision for ways to monetize it and so on. Like he's such a successful leader, like who's going to really question that? I think it's more a matter of um, a a decision or sets of decisions um, being made. I'll give you a very quick practical example. We could charge for the download of our app uh, from the outset. Like the, the features that we're offering, we can get people to pay for this app. We decided to make it free for everyone to be able to access uh, because we think it is for the public's best interest to educate people, to personally guide them, to make them aware of the idea of biological age and so on. So we could have made a different decision here, but as a public benefit corporation, I felt more compelled to make it free and I felt more freedom to be able to make it free um, because we're a public benefit corporation, whereas if we were strictly for profit, um, which we are still a for profit entity, I don't want to c- confuse anyone. But if we were strictly a traditional company, I may have made the decision early on from the start to charge um, for the app. What's the best? Uh, what's the best age test you can get right now? Is that that D- Duden something? Do need in pace clock? I'd say is the okay. most accurate and, and precise. Um, that's what we offer in our kit. Um, we are we are agnostic to the tests that we offer. I mean, we we license it from a third party, so anyone who has the best test is who we'll go with. And we do believe that um, the do need and pace clock is is the most powerful one, especially because it's, it's your current trajectory of aging. It's like how fast or slow you're aging. Um, 
And so you have so to take that every three months in order to get a pace or? No, 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 no. No? You, you take it one time and they can tell you right now at this instant, based on your your lifestyle over you know the past few months, um, like it's influenced by the decisions you've been making. You know, if you if you got really drunk every week the last six weeks, that's going to impact your pace today, right? So okay, um, it's it's not like instantaneously. Like if I test today and then I test tomorrow, it can be vastly different. No, it's it's more like a cruise ship or the Titanic. It changes very gradually um, over time, and that's um, the that's trailing. testing. Uh, epigenetics is that what you said yes it's an okay. epigenetic got it epigenetic based test okay but it's telling you basically the way you've been living your life over the last three to six months is leading to you aging this fast or slow and so that's empowering because you can look back on what you've been doing and say okay actually i've been aging faster than i want to what can i change and you make those changes and you test again after say six months um, you're eating healthier, you're sleeping better, you're drinking less, you're more physically active, you have less stress in your life and all of these things. It's like, oh, wow, I went from 0.8 to 0.7. I'm aging 10% at a 10% slower pace than I was before. And that's very significant. It's, it's associated with reduced risk of morbidity, reduced risk of mortality. And if you maintain that over years, as we saw in the Do Need and Pace study, if you look at the graphics in there, they took images of the 10 youngest average and old fastest aging people, both male and female, and merge them with computer software. And so you can compare the slowest aging people to the fastest aging people, and they look like they're decades apart in terms of age, but they're all 45 years old um, chronologically. So when you see that, it's clear that if you're going to slow down your pace of aging, it will catch up with you in a positive sense. Like in 10 years from now, you might look five, six, seven years younger than your peers who haven't been taking care of themselves. And that that's a nice added benefit to slowing your aging is the more superficial aesthetic side of things too. So I see this on the rejuvenation Olympics. They're only testing the pace now. There's no like, oh, this person is the most young compared to their age. Uh, that's right. It, but it has always been that way. It has always been the pace. Okay. I want, I want to, I just want to tell people I'm this age biologically and tell them I'm 35 or something. Uh, having That's to explain a, the pace is like kind of, you know, buzzkill. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the, the way that I think you can, you can make it not a buzzkill is you just say like, I'm aging 20% slower than you or than the average person. Right. Um, but, but yeah, the biological age, we do offer that in the, in the Novos age clock test as well. So the Novos age kit includes your do need and pace of aging, your biological age, and your telomere length, all in one kit. And we're actually in the process of upgrading that biological age clock to the latest generation. And it's going to include added benefits as well. I can't share yet, but in the weeks ahead, we'll be releasing that and you'll see some additional um, outputs that will be part of that beyond just those three metrics. Okay, cool. All right, we'll check back in for that. All right, Chris. Well, uh, I guess we can wrap it up here. I, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm out of questions and I've got, this has been really informative and, uh, I think I'm going to go take that test. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. It was great to meet you. Thank you. 